I was originally planning on releasing a Minnesota Timberwolves video today, but after seeing Joel Embiid and Tyrese Maxey drop 86 on their heads, I think them and the Philadelphia 76ers should get priority. I have absolutely zero clue what got into me, but I saw Embiid 45 plus on FanDuel at plus 800 pregame and probably took my greatest shot ever. But while one of my best experience at a sporting event fueled this video, it isn't the topic of discussion. Nick Nurse and the New Look Sixers are absolutely dominating teams, including the number one defense and team in the NBA. Tyrese Maxey looks like a bona fide star, and while I already dropped a video about his insane leap, I'll speak about him today as well. I released a video around September about the Sixers genuinely confused about what the plan was with the Harden saga lingering. And while moves still must be made, I feel infinitely better about this team now versus then. Today I will be going over the Sixers' insane start, Joel Embiid's historic season, Tyrese Maxey's rise to stardom, and where Daryl Morey must go from here. Before we get into this, if y'all could like the video, sub the channel, and hit that noti bell, I would really, really appreciate it. It would help me out a ton. And without further ado, let's get right into the video. While many working parts are responsible for the historic start in Philadelphia, I believe Nick Nurse to be the main catalyst. While Joel and Tyrese certainly improved on their own, I think being in such a basic and predictable offense with Doc Rivers limited them. Basically, while I think last season was crucial in both of their developments, I also think they were already better than we may have thought. Obviously, James Harden is A or the reason for Joel and Tyrese taking full control of the offense, but pre-injury and benching, Tyrese last year was putting up around 23, and Joel obviously had an MVP year alongside James. While our offense last year was potent in the regular season, it was mostly dependent on Joel and James and the lack of spacing and movement made the offense easy to read and defend in playoff settings. I'm going to discuss the role players in more detail, but I think Nurse's coaching is a big point there as well, so I'll give credit where credit is due right now. The funniest thing is I've written nearly 200 words in this section and haven't even mentioned the defense. While any Embiid anchor is good for at least a top 10 to 12 defense, the tenacity of Nick Nurse's defensive philosophy has completely changed the Philadelphia 76ers defense. Doc Rivers teams without Kevin Garnett are historically sluggish, and I think that issue should be off the table now. The Sixers currently have the number one offense and number five defense in basketball, creating for a number one net rating of 11.4, which would rank fourth ever behind just the 96 and 97 Bulls, as well as the 2017 Golden State Warriors. While I would not have us as the championship or even Eastern Conference favorite due to this, it definitely deserves to be mentioned. While Nick Nurse's coaching tactics have had a far-reaching impact on the Sixers organization as a whole, he's not the one putting the ball in the basket. I was originally going to talk about Embiid last, but I think I want to do it now. This man is averaging 35, 12, and 6 on 65% true shooting with elite rim protection. I do not care what you think about Embiid, his playoff history which has been largely impacted by injuries that 90% of other stars would sit out two months with, but anyways, or anything else, this is absolutely historic stuff. Also, I guess I'll mention the schedule narrative which went viral because the hate boner for Embiid has been up since May and hasn't come down once. This was not only obviously just proven to be completely idiotic last night, but was completely dumb in the first place. Every NBA team has more or less the same schedule. 58 of every team's 82 games are exactly the same, as every team plays every team at home and on the road at least once, with the other determinants being division and in-conference opponents. Even with this, if we look at the top three MVP candidates' divisions, the Atlantic division has to be the best. The worst team there is the Raptors, while the Central Division has both the Pistons and the Bulls, and the Northwest Division has the Jazz and the Blazers. The Eastern Conference argument is also just unbelievably idiotic, as both conferences have three bottom feeders and 9-10 to 10 decent teams. Oh yeah, the East kinda also has two super teams. While you could argue the West is better as a whole, the gap is small enough to where either side could be argued. I really only gave this the time of day because I have to assume most people don't actually know how scheduling works because I don't know how else this got the traction that it did. Anyways, this season, Joel Embiid has had 32, 13, and 5 versus Cleveland, 35, 11, and 9 versus OKC, 30, 11, and 11 versus the Lakers, and 51, and 12, and 3 versus the Wolves. He also put up 38, 13, and 4 with two steals and two blocks for a week without playing a single fourth quarter. I do not care who you're playing, that is absolutely unreal. I know he'll never be widely respected until he can put together a healthy playoff run, but the hate and goalpost moving is legitimately unbelievable. And bro, I, I don't know, it just keeps getting worse. I, I don't know how it keeps getting worse. I'm like, bro, it has to stop at some point, right? Like, it has to stop at some point. There's no way they're going to talk about a second round series all summer, right? Right? And even in, like, bro, it's crazy. 
I, like, again, I get it. But if we want to, like, go and, again, if we want to go look at this, we want to go look at torn meniscus, uh, Ben Simmons shooting 30% from the free throw line, clogging up the whole court, playing 4v5 on offense. Want to go to last year, you got P.J. Tucker, you got Doc, like, bro, I'm going to put a picture on the screen. I'm, I'm done with this whole rant. But, like, bro, like, people actually think this guy just isn't good, and it's, like, actually really funny. Again, the Brooklyn series. If you actually watched the basketball games, you could see that they were literally just trying to stop Embiid and not anyone else. Tyrese Maxey and Tobias Harris were having shoot-around in that Brooklyn series. Again, not making it out of the second round at this point is kind of crazy, and I'm not going to do this whole thing right now, but, like... You actually go and look at the circumstances and actually, you know, like, again, man, 2019, 2023, they played the best teams. I, again, obviously, you know, Denver's the best team now, but going into that playoffs, Boston was consensus the best team. In 2019, the Raptors, I mean, bro, like, again, historic team, and that's also, you know, he was 24, but again, I, I, I don't, like, this isn't about fucking Embiid's legacy, but bro, like, just like, the, the amount of stuff is just crazy. Like, I, I really wonder, like, you know, like, because people will go like, oh, like, you know, like, LeBron gets a ton of hate, obviously, but I feel like the love, like, balances it out. I genuinely feel like Joel Embiid has to have, like, by a decent margin outside of, like, you know, like, really, really terrible bad people. For the amount of people that are aware of him, he has to have the lowest percentage of people with a positive view of him. And the free throw thing is stupid as well. Again, every great player shoots free throws. If you watch the games, you see that they're fouling him because, again, these people can't guard him. And again, also, he's the only true, like, like again, Jokic plays back to basket, but he's, like, he passes that, like, you know, he, he's not a traditional big man. Joel Embiid is the last, like, no one else is really, like, a traditional post-scoring gonna post you up. Like, no one in the NBA has really guarded that. Like, the only guys who have really guarded that are the guys that, you know, you know like, the Marcus Halls and the Al Horfords and the guys that have been here, you know, since there was, you know, the Tim Duncans and, you know, since the early 2010s and since the post-game was really a thing. These new guys, everyone drafted, like, I don't know, even like 2015 and after, we could go 2016, 20, like, the last five to seven years, everyone that's been drafted, like, they're not playing against dominant big men. The league is, did not, was not run by big men again until recently. So again, uh, I, I, you know, again, I, I get it. People don't really watch basketball. People watch maybe one to two games a week, prime time, and they're like half watching it. People don't watch and understand basketball, and people go on Twitter and TikTok and see two videos. Basically, people watch TikTok more than they watch basketball, or Twitter more than they watch basketball. Anyways, that was a really, really, really great rant, and uh, I, I think I'm going to close it off now. Enough about 21. Let me talk about Tyrese Maxey again. As I said, I did release a video solely about Tyrese if you do want to hear more, but I think we can finally exhale. Tyrese Maxey is clearly here and keeps amazing me night after night. Tyrese is efficient 35 against the best defense in the league, got somewhat lost in the Embiid 50 ball, which is understandable but still unfortunate. The development as a playmaker is just truly amazing to me. I thought that with being on the ball more, Tyrese would improve obviously, but the leap he has taken is something that seemed like a pipe dream just 6 short months ago. Tyrese is a legit 25-7 and seven guy and one of the best shooters in the NBA. I have been waiting for over a half decade for a co-star with a seamless fit with Joel, and he is finally here. While this team has had a historic start and role players like Pat Bev, Kelly Oubre, Rocco, and Batum were outstanding pickups, I think we all know at least one other move is coming. With the expiring money of Tobias Harris and Marcus Morris and a suddenly sizable draft stash including many high value picks, I think a major move is in the works. Zach Levine was the name for a while, and while I am not as opposed to this as many and believe Zach has become vastly underrated, it will likely not happen and I am completely fine with that. As I said, I am higher on Zach than many, but I do not like the idea of finally getting off the Tobias contract to inherit a very questionable 4 years, $180 million. As I said, you know, again, I think Levine's a lot better than what people are giving him credit for. People really think that, like, the Bulls, like, actually, like, are a lot better. I mean, they are better because he's out of there because he was checked out. But, again, man, like, like Zach Levine is a hooper. Y'all are, whenever he gets moved, like, y'all are going to see again. I don't think we should get him. I, the contract situation, everything, I don't really think we should. But he's been so disgusted, you know, I thought I'd bring it up. But the new hot name on the market is Laurie Markkinen, and I would absolutely love this. The big wing is a passable defender and an absolute bucket. While I have been heavily against pairing Joel with another big or interior scorer again, like say maybe a Siakam who's available, Lori is an exception to that rule. I have just been so tired, you know, again, this doesn't really apply here because Lori is an exception, but I have been so tired of Joel Embiid sharing the court with at least two power forwards in every playoffs except 2022. 
2019, you have, bro, I don't care. Ben Simmons is a power forward. You don't even want to call him a power forward. He's a 6'10 dude who doesn't shoot the ball. He's not good for spacing. He has had at least two of Ben Simmons, Tobias Harris, PJ Tucker on the court with him, Al Horford on the court with him, two alongside him in every playoff run except 2022. Again, another thing, I, I, you, you know what, fine. You know, you know the, the Embiid rant will leak into this a little bit. That's the other thing. People look at names on a page and think that it worked. The Sixers have had some of the worst roster construction of all time since post Jimmy Butler. And even that team didn't really fit very well if you were watching. But anyways, while Laurie is seven feet tall, he has even slid to the three at points in his career and since his emergence in Utah has made nearly 40% of his threes while shooting nearly eight a night from deep. Laurie would be the offensive presence and firepower that would somehow take this offense to new heights while not being the worst defender in the world. He is also under contract for this and next season at around 18 million, so we would retain some cap flexibility this summer. I absolutely love the idea of Laurie and Philly for a number of reasons, and while they aren't my ideal target, either Jordan Clarkson or Colin Sexton could potentially be the secondary ball handler we're in need of. By the way, no one is trading five first for Laurie, have y'all not met Danny Ainge. Do we need a 25 point per game guy like Levine anymore? No, but do we need an Alex Caruso or Monte Morris who can take some of the heat off Joel and Tyrese? In my opinion, absolutely. While our playoff offense will look infinitely better even as the roster stands, I think playoff game plans will obviously do a better job at neutralizing Tyrese. As I said, there are many options here, but the one I am keyed in on is Alex Caruso. He is arguably the hot name around the league this year due to how he can fit pretty much anywhere. What I love about Caruso also is his defensive potential. While DeAnthony Melton is a solid defender, Caruso's versatility and just being a better defender definitely warrants the upgrade. The only thing throwing a wrench in this plan is the Bulls actually winning, but I think they are playing hardball and will end up moving Caruso. It's smart in all honesty, while he is a role player, he is arguably one of their most valuable assets with widespread interest. While Melton is a clear downgrade, he is a decent starter who could play a somewhat similar role to Caruso in Chicago. Obviously, pick compensation would be there as well, but I think an offer with Melton who can be a seamless quality replacement if they're really going to keep trying to win would be more enticing than maybe some other offers. Again, the Sixers also not only have picks, but valuable picks. While Laurie and Caruso are my dream targets, there are also many other names on the market who I think could be great pickups. I'm not going to discuss any more in detail, but I do have one more thing to say. Get rid of Tobias Harris at all costs. I am so, so serious. If you cannot trade him, cut him. His minutes being consumed by Batum, Rocco, House, and Morris would legitimately make this team better right now. As he is expiring, should we make pretty much any major move, he should be out, but I just wanted to emphasize this. Him being out there alone is a negative, and we do not need to retain equal or literally any value to get better. Him and Doc Rivers were the two things holding this team back, and if we can finally get problem number two out, look out. A report also came out today from Shams that there are a couple teams with interest in Tobias Harris. I mean, you know, again, I, I think it could be advantageous for some teams, you know, like people are saying Detroit, you know, teams that aren't really going to get free agents and can maybe, you know, extend him, you know, maybe like 15 to 20 a year, get a somewhat decent player, you know, for like a pretty decent contract. You know what I mean? That's kind of my logic to why teams would be interested because he's expiring and they could probably get some draft assets in the process. To wrap this up, I just really can't believe where we are with the Sixers. The doom and gloom of this offseason and the Harden saga had me completely out on this team once again. But of course, they just have to pull me back in, and damn it, they got me. While I wouldn't expect them to beat Boston or Milwaukee, I expected the series against Boston last year to be five games, so there's that. The Nick Nurse signing had me excited somewhat, but with how I perceived the state of the roster, it was hard to be confident. Tyrese Maxey was also somewhat of a question mark. I knew he would average 25 no matter what, but for him to become the co-star we needed, he needed to have an impossible playmaking leap, and well, he did. I don't know where this Sixers team goes from here, but I'm having a whole lot of fun right now, and that's cool. That's going to wrap this one up. If y'all enjoyed it, please like it up, sub the channel, hit that noti bell. I would really, really appreciate it. Small NBA YouTuber trying to grow out here, and I'm out. Peace.